so now I am super happy to bring out our next keynote speaker. Um, I first met Lovey in 2009, I think. Her first blog her was 2010. Um, she was a blogger who was already doing great things with her nonprofit and had this amazing voice. When people ask me what it takes to be a successful blogger, there's a whole school of thought that you need to have a really narrow topic, a really unique topic. And I'm like, you can also have a really unique voice. And Lovey is the person that I always used as one of my examples. Um, and so it's really such a great honor for me to bring her out today and talk to her with you. Um, please welcome Lovey Ajayi. <laughs> all right, all right, we're gonna go on a Lovey journey. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons that you were the very first person when we scheduled Blogger 17, Lovey was the very first person that we called and asked to keynote, and it was because we wanted to talk about the hard work that goes into being what some people might perceive as an overnight success. Right. You've had an amazing last year or two, and we're going to talk about that, but I actually want to talk about when we met back in 2009 and 2010, and what was the, what were you doing then? What inspired you to start blogging? Did you have that voice before? Did the blog help you find the voice? Like, what was that origin story of Awesomely Lovey? The origin story. So, back in 2009, I was marketing coordinator for a nonprofit in Chicago. And it was a nonprofit that taught other nonprofits how to use social media to tell their stories. So, I actually asked my boss and was like, hey, there's this conference called Blog Her that's coming to Chicago. Can I go? And they were like, sure. So they bought my first pass to blog her. Oh, thank you, nonprofit. <laughs> thank you, uh, Tom Clark, <laughs> shout out. And I came to blog her just to see what the conference is about. At this point, my blog was um, three years old. It was called Awesomely Lovey at that point, yeah, because I think before then it was called Lovey's Random Rants, which is essentially what Awesomely Lovey is. Um, and I just came to the conference. I remember it was in the Hilton, Ohio, this downtown. And I kind of just hung out in the lobby for the whole thing. I don't even think I went to a lot of sessions. I hung out in the don't lobby. Don't tell our programming <laughs> team. Sorry. See, what happened was um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just hanging in the lobby, but I think I end up meeting a lot of really cool people, w went to some of the after parties, and I was like, okay. And then 2010, 2010 basically changed my life. Like, that is the year that I can pinpoint was like my life went from, okay, on this like very sure path to, everything was up in the air. Cause in 2010, uh, April, I got laid off that job because budget cuts. And then I, this time I got pitched to blog her to be on a panel for humor writing yeah. by Liz Winstead. Which was so, I was like, how do you know who I am? So I ended up going to blog her that year for the first time as a speaker in New York. Mm -hmm. And I remember the cheeseburger party. Uh. And I woke up the next day with a cheeseburger in my purse. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but <laughs> that, year, that year was a year that I basically had to venture out to work for myself. I, I didn't think blogging was a career for me, though. I wasn't taking it seriously at so that point. What did you think your career was going to be? I thought, it was just, I thought blogging was just a hobby. I thought it was just this cute thing that I've been doing for such a long time. And I was still on LinkedIn every, every week looking for jobs and in marketing and social media. So I was still like, okay, this blogging thing is still cute, but like, I need a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So I would send out my resume and try to get a gig, and then on the side to bring in cash in the meantime, because I'm a hustler, I, I was doing social media strategy for bloggers, and I was building websites, because I learned how to build websites. I built all my own websites, so I was making money that way, but not like, real money to sustain me, or not even the money that I was making in my full-time job. Mm -hmm. So how did you learn how to build websites? Like, you just taught yourself? I taught myself. And then I also went to, um, yeah, I watched some YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I, used my, I always use myself as an example. So I built my own website first. And then I was like, oh, I could do this. And I put my name on Design by Awesomely Lovey. And then other people saw that Design by Awesomely Lovey was like, oh, can you design my website? So I ended up designing my girl Afrobella's website. And then people, yeah, shout out to Afrobella. And then I started getting a lot of clients from that. And I was like, okay, but still, this is not my job. Ah. 
So yeah. you were still looking for a marketing job? I was still looking for a marketing job. I was looking at my email address and I still saw I was sending out emails. All, I mean, I was sending out resumes even up to December 2012. Wow, really? I'm stubborn. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't understand that it was kind of the universe trying to grab my face. I was like, pay attention. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Because I was like, I need uh, a job that's going to pay me every two weeks because I have a shoe habit. And like, <laughs> this is not going to pay so, me. So how did you sustain yourself when you were, because I've done consulting before, and it's, um, it can be very feast or famine. Yeah. And the other thing is you can always feel like if, if you don't like sales, being a salesperson too bad, because that when you have your own company, whether you're founding an actual company or whether you're just consulting or trying to freelance, you're selling yourself. Like you're finding right. that next gig, that next customer. How are you? You know what? I was fortunate. Again, the fact that my name said like designed by Awesome Love You, but I got so many clients who like help me do my website, help me do social media strategy. And then being a salesperson, the stuff that people don't like in terms of cold calling, I didn't have to cold call because what I ended up doing was using Facebook mm. and Twitter. So I would, anytime I finished designing somebody's website, I'd post it on Facebook and be like, hey, check out the website that I just designed. That would get me a couple more clients. Mm -hmm. So I was selling myself each and every day and I still do it. Because when you show the work that you do, it's telling people that you're capable of doing it. Right. And then that begets you more clients. Yeah, and I think sometimes we're so constrained about, I don't want to promote myself. I don't want to be self promoting But that, it doesn't matter. I mean, I kind of find it doesn't matter what industry you're in. There's two things that I think are universal truths. It doesn't matter what industry you're in or what you're doing. You're going to have to sell yourself right. to do anything. And the other universal truth is it's not always the, the, the nice guy that gets ahead and the terrible person who gets demoted. You know, you, you all know jerks who get ahead and great people who don't, and usually it's that difference about how Let me tell you, the world, is not, the world is not a meritocracy. It's one of those things right. that you just have to accept. Now, a lot of us feel some type of way about self-promoting, but honestly, if you don't promote yourself, nobody else will. And you don't have to promote yourself. <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> okay, I didn't even start preaching yet, all right? Um, <laughs> You don't have to promote yourself in like, hey, hire me. That's not necessarily the way to do it. You tell the story about who you are and what you do. And in it, people see your capabilities. So I've just constantly told my story in that way. So again, when I finished designing somebody's website, I'd be like, hey, check out their website. People were like, oh, I didn't even know you designed. Cool. Let me hire you to do that. And in that way, that constant telling of your story and of the work that you do is a way to promote yourself without saying, hey, hire me. You don't necessarily have to say hire me. Did you ever um, turn to other people who knew you to help you see how your what your brand was or help you, you know, did you always have it totally locked and loaded? So I, I feel like the word brand got, at one point became a buzzword, a meaningless buzzword. Okay, but, but, let's, but let's just accept But in the way, no, but in the way that it means for me is that my brand was the voice that I had built right. and what people were saying about me when I'm not in the room. And it's that piece, that second piece, that really spurred my elevation, right? So it's like, yeah, I did ask my friends, like, hey, what, how would you describe me? You know, what are the things that you read about? What makes you think about me when I'm not there? And I started understanding that, for example, when I started my blog, I didn't call it a humor blog, because I didn't have a niche for it. I didn't have a box to put it in. I was just writing, and then when people started laughing at what I was writing, I was like, oh, this is a humor blog, so my brand and being a humor writer came from me understanding how people were viewing my work. Yeah. As opposed to me defining myself like, I'm funny, or humor calling writing. the honorable. Oh God, <laughs> the honorable awesomely lovey. Um, <laughs> but it's understanding and listening that your brand is really not what you think about yourself. Yeah. It is what other people think when they think about you. When it, and it's best when most of the people in the room can think one thing, the same thing. Like, if you're in one room and there's 20 people and those 20 people think of 20 different things and they think about you, you don't have a strong brand. Right. So for me, it, came, it became a matter of like, most people who were reading my blog were laughing and saying, this is really funny, this is thoughtful. Cool, I was like, cool, I'm a humor writer. Right. All right then. I mean, that's true for companies too. It's the hardest thing for them to grasp about social media is to find out that they don't control what their brand is. It's right. what all the people, all of us are saying out there that defines it. Right. And it's true for us as humans too. But it, and I know we, get, get, we can get squicky about the term personal brand, yeah. but it's just a symbol of knowing what you stand for, exactly. being authentic to what works, having some consistency. And like there's an exercise going around on Facebook right now about, oh, what's the first thing 
you think about, when you think about me, I don't know how many of you have done that with anyone. There's, it's like one of those answer five questions. And I would just say, Facebook is probably getting all sorts of interesting data about you from those answers. When you could just email 10 of your friends and ask them to do that with you, and it yeah. probably would be yeah. super helpful. Right. So one of the most interesting things I've found about um, you talking about as you've progressed is the times when you've learned to outsource and step back. So before you learned to do that, like what was the grind? I feel like a lot of times people ask me how to make a living, how to make a livelihood, um, and they don't realize how much it's a full-time job for the people who are making a living and a livelihood. Yeah. Um, and so what was the grind like, and then what was your, you know, Ariana Huffington always tells the story about falling asleep and like hitting her head on her desk, and that's why she's so into sleep right now. So like, <laughs> what's, your, what's your head desk moment? Oh gosh, okay, so after 2010, I had my nonprofit, The Red Pump Project, executive director of this national nonprofit that's raising awareness about HIV and AIDS in women. I had my blog, I was doing the consulting thing, and then there was that one time when I had a temp job and it only lasted for five hours. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know what, that's what made me realize, okay, I get it, Jesus. You want me to work for myself, because I ain't gonna make it. Um, <laughs> okay, so why five hours, what, what happened? <laughs> I haven't heard this story before. Oh, man. I want to know. So, so, again, sending out my resumes, I was like, okay, I want to do social media. Great. So this global brand, it's like a big brand, hired me full time to do their social media wow. right. strategy in Chicago, and I'd have to come into the office. This is 2012, and I was like, great. I put on my slacks, <laughs> you know, like my button up, because I was like, yeah, it's going to be a great employee. Showed up, like, day one. I had to review a bunch of PowerPoints. I was like, great. And then 1 p.m. hit. And I went to slide off my chair into the ground. I was just like, Jesus, I ain't gonna make it. I ain't gonna make it till five. I ain't gonna make it till five o'clock. I gotta stay here till five? God. I'm usually taking my like, afternoon naps at this time. I can't. And what was the brand? Lunchable. Oh, I was, that's so funny, because I was like, does it rhyme with Shrek? But <laughs> no, I think it was Lunchables. And I was like, I like Lunchables. Well, Lunchables Great. is a craft brand, isn't it? Yeah, craft brand. Yeah, so at 5 o'clock, I sent an email to myself through their email thing that I was going to send the next morning. I was like, hey, so I'm not going to be there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was day one and last day. And I was like, okay. Wow. And literally, that was the moment when I was like, okay, I have to work for myself because I can't do this anymore. That was it. But wait, what was the first question? I can't remember. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, well, now that you've told us all about your afternoon naps, I'm not sure if your question about oh, the grind, no, but the grind is really is relevant. No, it is. <laughs> so, okay, so I was doing all that stuff. After the temp job thing failed, and I was like, I ain't going to make it. Fine, I got to do this by myself. Then my, my, my grind really went into hyperdrive of being like, do or die, sink or swim. So you've got to do this. So I once you turn down a full-time social media job, you better. You, I, I better. Up. I was like, because that was going to pay me like good money. You and can I was, have benefits. I, I was at benefits and insurance. Jesus, like I walked away from that. That's how you know that wasn't for me. Okay, I walked away from monies. Um. <laughs> so I really like intensified my grind. I was like, great, fine. You know you can't work for nobody else now. You're gonna have to make this thing work for you. So it means your blog, yeah, you're going to be blogging every single day. It means Red Pump, great. You're going to make sure this organization floats, okay? Three, you're going to make sure that you never have to struggle for money again. So it meant I was up till 3 o'clock in the morning some days, and then Scandal came out around that time. <laughs> Let me tell you. So, okay, <laughs> when Scandal came out, I, I wasn't intending for Scandal to become a thing for me, right? Scandal came out, I fell in love with the show, I started writing recaps for it. So my Thursday nights went like this. I'd watch Scandal from eight to nine. I'd, I spent an hour falling out and be like, why? What just happened? <laughs> Literally, I spent one full hour just having a tantrum in my house, like, why Jesus? Why did it have to happen? Come on, Olivia, get it together. <laughs> and then after I got it together a little bit, I'd eat. And then by, by the time I got my bearings back, it was like midnight. And I would, blog, I, would, I would write my scandal recaps after midnight. And scandal recaps take me three hours to write. Those 3,500 word recaps took three hours. So on Thursdays, I wasn't sleeping much. Because I'd write till three, I'd go to sleep for four hours, wake, wake back up, do everything else I was supposed to be doing. When scandal blew up, it became a thing. Right. 
like my, my recaps became a thing and people were like, okay, my schedule on Thursdays is I'm gonna watch Scandal, I'm gonna fall out for a couple of hours, and then I'm gonna wake up the next morning and read Lovey's, Lovey's uh, recap. So that became like an expectation for me. So I could not let Thursdays pass by without writing these recaps. And no matter where I was in the world, I would make these rec recaps happen come hell or high water. Talk about the grind. Like there were many days where I was like, I mean, exhausted. And I went to Kenya, because I was like, okay, I, I'm going with my friends, vacation. Scandal came on in the US. I used a VPN to watch it while everybody else is watching in the US. And at that point, it's like 4 o'clock in the morning oh in Kenya. God. Four, or th three or four. And the rest of my friends are asleep. Scandal ends, and I was like, okay, well, you can't even, you don't even have time to fall out right now. You, <laughs> you just gotta get back to writing. So the show ended. And it's in the middle of the night, still have not slept. And I turn out this, this recap. My friends wake up at seven o'clock. They're like, we're going to the Elephant Orphanage. And I was like, I have this recap to finish. Save yourself, go without me. Um, <laughs> and they were like, okay, how much longer do you need? I said, an hour. They waited for me. And as soon as I finished, I published it. And then I went to the Elephant Orphanage. This is also when Vulture hired me to write scandal recaps. So I had to write two scandal recaps. So they, they had to be different? They had to be different. So I was writing two scandal recaps every Thursday night. So I had finished the one for Vulture in two hours and then I had to write mine for three and three more hours. That was a grind, lot of scandal. It was a lot of scandaling. And they were very separate. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally writing 5,000 words about scandal every week. On top of my nonprofit, this was in March. And March is my nonprofit's biggest month of the year because that's uh, National Women and Girls HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. So as I'm in Kenya, our, my nonprofit is also doing four events that, that, uh, that month around the country at the same time and a massive campaign. So as all of this is happening, I'm also doing that and I'm on vacation. Oh, that's vacation? That was vacation. Right. I came back. I need to talk to you about the definition. Of vacation, of right? Vacation. Oh, no, I know better now. Um, I just haven't been on one in a while. But when I think about the grind, I think about those times of actively almost burning myself out to be productive, just so people have these expectations that I don't wanna disappoint. And because there are certain things that are proprietary to my brain, I can't give somebody else a scandal recap to write. Right. I can't give somebody else like the strategy to write for me. So is the solution then that you started resetting people's expectations? Or yes. Or you outsourced other stuff that wasn't proprietary to your brain? I started resetting expectations, one. You, okay. Your audience will behave how you train them to behave, and this sounds weird, but I had, ex I had made my audience depend on my scandal recaps. I was like, y'all will see these recaps come hell or high water, which meant on Friday mornings when they didn't see this recap, they were sitting on my blog like, I'm refreshing, where is it? <laughs> so then I started being like, y'all, I'm tired, I ain't got the recap for you today. I'm like, y'all recap it yourselves, I'll be back. Um, that was one, and then two, looking around me to see what I could outsource. Mm -hmm. At this point, that's when I was like, okay, the empire of one has got to end. This is not sustainable, because we think we can do everything we, at the same time, and I was doing it, sure. but, but it was meaning that I was only getting three to four hours of sleep. Some, something suffers, and sometimes it's the work that suffers, I think, when people approach that burnout, but yeah. usually it's the human that suffers. Oh, the human side the of suffering, scenes. and yeah. people never see it. Like, I was, and then I'm on planes, and I'm doing all these trips. I was hitting walls, like constantly hitting walls, and people did not see it. So I finally was like, okay. And then I got the book deal. So then the book deal sat on top of that, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna be doing all this and writing a book? Something's gonna fail, but see, I already signed this contract for this book, so um, <laughs> I need uh, to drop one of these things, two of these things, and I end up dropping Scandal Recaps last year. And it was crazy, because I felt such guilt about it. I couldn't do it anymore because on Thursday nights, I wasn't even home. Like, I wasn't even in Chicago to be sitting still watching Scandal anymore. Every Thursday, basically since January, I've only been home two, two Thursdays, two or three, literally since January of 2017. So I dropped that. I dropped the whole idea of having to blog every single day too. Y'all might get a blog post from me once a week now, mm -hmm. and that's okay, Go read my archives. You've got a lot of them. <laughs> I've written 1,500 blog posts over the years, at least. Go ahead and read some of them. You've missed some, so you could, they could definitely, you could. But I, I'm really at a, in a place right now where I want to especially encourage women to outsource their lives. Like, the, 
I have to say, the empire of one has to end because I hate that whole phrase that I see on social media by the Instagram motivational speakers. That's like, you have the same 24 hours in the day as Beyonce. You do not have the same 24 <laughs> hours in the day. You do not. Beyonce got 240 hours in her day because she has a machine behind her. You have 24 hours, and in that 24 hours, you probably have to make sure your family's okay, you have to make sure you're doing laundry, you have to make sure your bills are being paid, and then you have to figure out the blog too, and then people are being made to feel guilty that they're not somehow being Beyonce because they only have 24 hours. Don't do that. Yeah. So my whole thing is I want to encourage women to, just entrepreneurs, bloggers, buy time as opposed to always selling yours. And that means get an assistant. And my, I've had, I have two assistants now. And just the amount of stuff that they take off my plate. Like they send me their timesheets and it's 30 hours of stuff I didn't have to do myself. Right. Yeah, I had this moment. I had blog her and she knows we never had admins really. So I was always doing all my own kind of stuff. And I had this one week when I went to New York and I had booked my hotel, it was ad week, but I wasn't there for ad week. But anyway, I get to the hotel and I booked it for the following week. <laughs> And then, <clears throat> so that was a whole thing. And then yeah. that same week, I'd made reservations for a client dinner, and they were there, but saying, oh, you made the reservation for the wrong night. <sighs> and I was like, oh my god. Like, and I'm a, I'm a super anal retentive organized person. Right. This was like, this is wrong. So yeah, I started just out of my pocket. I started working with a VA who was a blogger, and she would just do that stuff because I was getting bad at it and yeah. that's very painful. And I, yeah, um, and, and you know, like, think about it like this. Like, you might say, like, I don't really have any extra money right now. If you can budget 50 bucks a week, possible, okay? Get a VA that you're paying $10 an hour that can give you five hours of work. What that does is free your brain up to then, that's five hours that you can be pitching to a brand, right? Five hours that you can be updating your media kit. Because since I outsourced my team, like my whole life, essentially, I've been able to triple my income in a year. That's strictly because I'm no longer answering small emails. My Google Calendar is not, no, is, I'm not the one sitting up here putting in like flight things in there. If I need something research done, I can send a text message and say, hey, research this for me, send me the spreadsheet. From that spreadsheet, I can pitch the brands. So being able to really understand what, that when you buy time back, you're buying, it's money in your pocket. Because then you can use it for bigger things. And I bet a lot of people out here um, can offer services like that. Yes. And a lot of out people out here could use services like that. And it's a great way to kind of bolster both sides of that. Yeah. Um, so, so over the last year, you got your book deal, your book came out. I mean, you had primed the pump for many years to have a fan base that would make your book a huge success, yeah. which it was, sold quickly, sold great. And you asked, you know, the thing I really respected about what you did was you were, you made no bones about it. You were like, guys, I need this book to sell a lot of copies during this time frame. Please just do it. And so I know so many authors who do not so explicitly just ask their community for what they actually need for it to be a success. Because it's not just, uh, you know, I have a friend who sold in aggregate enough copies of his books that he should be just sought after, but it was over time yeah. and they really want to see it in that window yeah. and so you were so explicit about it and I thought that was a big part of why people were like okay I'm I'm there um, and so so we all know over the, the any of us who follow you know after the last year or, or two the book sold the TV deal came um, I am going to ask you for spoilers in just a minute but, but we'll see we'll see if you will share anything but um, what uh, that's all amazing you've been in some amazing places you've met some amazing people You've sold an amazing amount of books. Amazing, amazing, amazing. What's not amazing? Cha, let me tell you. <laughs> what is not amazing is still having to sometimes like overprove myself, mm. right? Because I'm a black woman. Like, is the fact that I find out after the fact some of the deals I get and find out that somebody else who is not even anything close to as big as me got double or t child let me tell you um I ain't gonna throw no shade today Jesus um okay <laughs> but just that that constant like your success is considered a fluke your failure is considered like represent like, so for the, the, the book for example like I was so adamant on this book hitting the New York Times bestseller list and this book selling many copies because 
publishing is really hard. It's, it's, it's hard for everybody, but then when you're a black woman, you don't get the deals that everybody else gets. And then if my book had failed, my book would have been considered the rule. That failure would be somebody else making it that much harder to have a book deal. So like, if, if my book did not sell that well, and I have this massive audience online, right, the next black girl who wants to get a book deal will have to explain themselves against my book's failure. So they'll have to say, Lovey's book did not do well, so here's what I would do different. So I yeah. knew that that would be a thing. So I'm like, I need this book to do well so somebody else can walk into a publishing house and not have to be declined. Like, my book was turned down by a bunch of editors who thought it was too risky. And I was like, bloop, um, <laughs> hope you're sad now. Um, I had to do that. Okay, one shade, okay. Um, just one. I'm probably doing a second one. I'm probably lying. Um, but it was, it was just very important that this book was a success to show that black women can sell books and that like, you should give us money to write them. Mm -hmm. So that was the proof. Um, and then the other not so amazing part, well, it's a first world problem, right? So when the book came out and the book was a huge success, I started getting pulled into a lot of directions of like, come here, do this, do that, right? So I found myself being like, okay, first world problem, I definitely understand. And, but having to under, have to have my own boundaries. Creating my own boundaries became really important because as my book got bigger, my profile got bigger, and then um, that made me nervous. That why, made me nervous. Why, why? You know what, I'm an introvert at, her, at heart. Like, I'm, I'm social, I'm not like, oh, I'm shy. I'm social, but I enjoy my privacy and my boundaries. You're pretty good at boundaries, though. I am. I mean, when it comes to your personal, personal life. Yeah. I am. Yeah, like what's going on there? You took a picture in a bathrobe with a man. <laughs> like, what? Did I really? Yes. Wait. No, you did a Facebook Live. You oh, did a Facebook oh, Live okay. in a beautiful hotel bathrobe and okay. spoke to someone uh, off camera. I want to know, like, who was that? You know, real G's got to move in silence, all right? <laughs> like lasagna, all right? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I'm just saying that was surprised. <laughs> I noticed it because oh, goodness, it was surprising because it felt um, outside your, the usual boundaries. Oh, it was absolutely outside my usual boundaries, and I keep it that way because I feel like when people feel like they have access to every piece of your life, they feel like they have say in every piece of your life. And as, as this awesomely loviness thing that gets bigger, which makes me nervous once again, as it gets bigger, I still want to protect certain pieces of my life and make sure that people understand they don't have access to it. And I give people access to a lot of my life, but there's pieces that I'm like, nope, X out, you know what I mean? So, um, and how does it change how you behave uh, you know, the boundaries is one thing, but how you are out in the world, you know, you have this platform now, you know, that okay. is, it was big already, yeah. and now it's bigger. It's, it's, and you don't know everybody, you know? I don't. So, okay, here's the part that gets me nervous, right? I'm little. I'm very small in stature. I talk mad shit, but I'm small. <laughs> <laughs> so, it means, like, physically, I could be moved. And it's happened. Right? It's happened when, like, I am in a, I went to um, a, a, a big, like, public picnic two weeks ago in Philly. And at one point, I lost my crew that I had come with, and I was walking through the, the place, and then people, somebody saw me who recognized me and was like, oh, my God, lovey! And, like, she grabs me, right? And me being, like, this little, I was like, oh, crap. Um, me having to physically, being able to like physically moved by somebody freaks me out. And that happens now, and it's so weird. And I have to understand that, I don't know, I, whenever that happens, when pe whenever people see me in fangirl, I'm always like, who are you talking to, me? Girl, I'm just me, stop playing. But I get recognized in public now, and it's, it's, it's strange. That piece is strange, I'm not used to that yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I, I just, I be walking downtown, I was walking downtown and literally somebody saw me and hugged me before they even said anything to me. And Natasha Nichols can tell you that is Don't not okay. Don't you hug okay. me. Stop it. Like, she literally, like, I was walking and she sees me and grabs me and then pulls back and says, oh my God, I love you. And I was like, what is happening? Yeah. So that was weird. And yeah, it, 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 it's weird. I don't know. I, I, I really love meeting my audience. Like, I ain't got no problem with no selfies. Don't, you don't got to fangirl, yeah, I'm regular. Um, 
But yeah, that's just one of those things that's like, but it doesn't change the way I, I move in the world, even though I've been told it should. Um, okay, so what, why should it, why do you reject that so for, advice? I reject the advice because I don't want to ever feel like I can't walk out in public, like freely, right? Um, I was told when I went to the picnic, I didn't have any VIP wristbands or nothing like that because I didn't tell nobody I was coming. And somebody was like, you can't be in jam pop. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean, like, what? So I see, the way I see myself has not changed. Right. I, I think it, other people see me differently. Right, you know? but you know your influence has changed. Yes, I do know my influence has changed. I know that my words carry more weight now, and I know that more people know who I am. And I also know that more, with, with that also comes uh, more people who would not like me. And honestly, to not like me right now has got to suck because I'm everywhere. <laughs> that's like, that's a Kelly Clarkson song right there. Isn't it? Is it really? It is, right? You know the song I'm talking about where she says, it's, it must suck to, because I'm everywhere. There's exactly, I'm oh, finding for you. Oh, I didn't even know. You. See? Come on, no Kelly Clarkson fans? No, Cla no, no. Oh, okay. I'm a dork. Okay, sorry. But yeah, no, like, I think it's just, it's interesting to see this elevation that's happening right now. Like, I call it the glow up. Well, we all call it glow up. Me and a whole bunch of my friends are currently in the glow up at the same time, which makes it amazing. Yeah. So, like, people like Francesca Ramsey. Issa Rae. Issa Rae. Blog her 2010. Yvonne Issa Orby. Rae, Francesca, no, 2012. Issa Rae, Francesca Ramsey, and Levia Jaya on one panel. On one panel. Blog her 2012. Y'all did that. Y'all did, did that. We did we that. We did. So, it's, it's really good to have my friends also be in the same place where everybody's career is doing this because then we have the text message sessions like this just happened, how should I handle it? We are able to support each other through the rough times. We're able to cheer each other through the great times. And then, yeah. Okay, so unfortunately, we are out of time. A spoiler, a spoiler. What's the TV About show? the show? Yeah, something. Give us um, something. So I am currently developing the show with Shonda. I'm writing. Thank you. Um, it's with Shonda Land, not just Shonda, Shonda Land. The um, whole land. The whole land. I am a resident of Shonda Land now. And the only thing I can tell you right now is that the show is going to center around a character that is a composite of me. So basically me on camera. Um, but I will not be acting in it because that is not my ministry. <laughs> Somebody else will do the acting, but I am going to be on Has the that writing. Has cast yet? I have an idea of who I want to play. Okay. Me? Who? I've already let Shonda know. We're working on it. Um, we can all apply social media pressure to get <laughs> what you want. You know, we're, you might not need to. But um, so cross your fingers because the option in means Shonda Land is going to try to make sure this ends up on television. It's not guaranteed to end up on television. If all goes well, it will end up on television. So hopefully this time next year, we'll be talking about I'm Judging You, the TV show. And, and I just wanted to say um, thank you to the blogger community. This has been a really, really, really important space for me in my career. And starting from 2009, when I just came as an attendee, 2010 on my first panel, to like pitching on the stage, and now keynoting is like such an amazing full circle moment. So thank you to your team. Y'all have a special place in my heart. Me and Blog Her will always go together. And uh, yes, thank you. And I have Judgy Pop. So if you see me out in these streets, ask me for Judgy Pop. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you, Jai. <laughs>